Uh, I am going to be talking tonight mostly about this book here, Beyond the Robot, uh, Life and Work of Colin Wilson. And I suspect by the demographic in front of me here that you, you, you know who Colin Wilson is. Um, but just to give you some background as to why um, <clears throat> this book came out now. This is the first, uh, not to sound too morbid, but full-length biography of him that covers from uh, his birth to uh, his death uh, uh, three years ago uh, and the uh, end of uh, 2013. And uh, Colin Wilson shot to fame, as the cliche goes, in 1956, 60 years ago, uh, when on May 28th his first book, The Outsider, was published, to practically universal acclaim. Wilson had spent the last 10 years of his life uh, walking the walk, as it were. Uh, he worked at a number of different menial jobs, always leaving them whenever the boredom set in, which tended to be fairly quickly. Uh, he hitchhiked around England and France. He slept rough. Most famously, uh, he slept up in Hampstead Heath in the summer of 1954, uh, when he was spending his days at the old reading room of the British Museum, which doesn't exist anymore, and was transformed into the new British Library uh, about 20 some, uh, years ago or so. Uh, and yes, while uh, he slept in a waterproof sleeping bag up on Hampstead Heath, at night uh, he cycled down at the break of dawn, had tea and dripping at a calf, man's, uh, uh, a calf uh, working man's calf somewhere on Chalk Farm Road, and then went to the British Museum reading room and worked on his first novel, Ritual in the Dark. But it wasn't that book that uh, shot him to his meteoric fame. It was a book called The Outsider that was published on that fateful morning. And as I say, Wilson had uh, confided in his journal uh, for years about his genius, about his brilliance, how important his work was and all that. And he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and taught himself how to write all, over all this time with many rejections and, you know, rejection slips as well. And he was sending out his short stories and other things to be printed. But on that morning, he woke up, and he suddenly realized that he was right. And people like Philip Toynbee and Cyril Connolly, who were the doyens of uh, English uh, literary criticism, or at least the highbrow book reviews at the time, uh, they agreed with him. And so did J.B. Priestley and Edith Sitwell and uh, quite a few other people, and across the Atlantic, too. Uh, Time magazine uh, had an article about him. Life did a photo shoot with him, uh, sleeping bag and all, uh, with uh, his turtleneck uh, sweater and national health glasses, leaning up against the tree that he used to sleep under, reading something. I was sort of the outsider at home, as it, as it were. Uh, but what happened is that Wilson, fortunately, unfortunately, uh, because, you know, blessings are often a curse, uh, became associated with a kind of ragtag group of writers that the uh, lit crits at the time corralled together and called the Angry Young Men. Uh, Wilson wasn't particularly angry. He was very young. He was 24 when he shot to fame. But these are people like John Osborne and uh, Kingsley Amos, who wasn't particularly young, and the um, literary, uh, the, the theater critic uh, Kenneth Tynan. And it was the, <clears throat> the coincidence of John Osborne's play, Look Back in Anger, uh, that had premiered at the Royal Court Theatre around the same time that Wilson's Outsider came out, that precipitated this invention of something called the Angry Young Men. They were supposed to be kind of the, the UK version of the American Beat generation. They were much more buttoned down, and they were much more about social issues. And it was much more about the kitchen sink kind of thing that we're more familiar with from that time than Wilson's concern. Uh, you know, The Loneliness of Long Distance Runner, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, uh, those kind of films. Um, Room at the Top, uh, that wonderful film with uh, Lawrence Harvey and all that. That's much more in keeping with the tone what the angry young men were about, but Wilson was about something completely different. Wilson was the first homegrown British existentialist. Uh, he was writing about the kinds of things that were occupying people like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus over in Paris. Uh, and he had been hobnobbing around Paris uh, in the early 50s, uh, before he became famous. 
uh, he, uh, he was, uh, <coughs> for a while he was making a few francs a day selling copies of the Paris Review, which was George Plimpton's magazine. Uh, it just came into existence then. George Plimpton, if you don't know who he is, was a, you know American figure in, in literature and also media and so on and so on. Uh, and then he also was involved early on trying to door-to-door -door selling copies of a magazine called Merlin uh, that was edited by the Scots beat poet and sadly heroin addict um, Alexander Truckee. So Wilson is on the scene, this kind of burgeoning kind of counterculture scene. But he wasn't interested so much in the social issues that occupy the younger young men. He was interested in what more or less were religious issues, but the meaning and purpose of life. And the outsider to him was the strange figure that he saw uh, kind of embodied in different ways with a, a very disparate group, hetero, het, heterogeneous group of individuals that included people like uh, the German philosopher Nietzsche or the Russian dancer Nijinsky or T.E. Lawrence of Arabia, or Vincent van Gogh, or uh, people like Hermann Hesse, or the, the heroes of Hermann Hesse's novels. Now, one of the things that Wilson doesn't get credit for is that he is very much responsible for the Hermann Hesse revival that happened in the 1960s and early 70s. No one had written about Hesse in English before. Hesse's novels were not in print. One or two of them were. No one was really paying any attention to him. And Wilson had discovered Hesse uh, through a contact with a fellow named Alfred Reynolds, uh, who was a Hungarian Jew and for a while ran a uh, kind of pacifist humanist group called The Bridge over in Warwick Gardens. Um, and he had introduced uh, Wilson to Hesse. And in The Outsider, Wilson's first book has the first extended discussion about Hesse's, Hesse's writings. I mean, there's other people, too, that Wilson was well ahead of the pack about. H.P. Lovecraft was one of those. Not in The Outsider, but in a later book called The Strength of Dream. Alistair Crowley. Uh, and a novel uh, called, well, originally called The Man Without a Shadow, but which uh, is known as The Sex Diary of Gerard Storm. So I'm just saying this, that Wilson was in many ways this kind of antennae of the race that you know, Ezra Pound talked about, how his, his sort of mental pseudopodia spread out into the future in many ways and anticipated many things that have subsequently become uh, you know, very much part of whatever you want to call the alternative culture and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but Wilson was concerned with questions of meaning and purpose, and The Outsider was a study in alienation, creativity, and extreme mental states. The Outsiders are these characters who, they hunger for a kind of meaning and purpose that the modern world cannot provide. Now, Wilson speculated that in the Middle Ages, there was something that could provide a, a kind of structure and a kind of um, place and environment. That would, that, that would nurture and satisfy this kind of hunger. You know, the, the, the church, uh, let us say, the time of the Gothic churches and all that. Um, but in our own modern time, the, 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 the Wilson, the church can no longer supply this. For a while, he actually thought of possibly entering a monastery, uh, but um, he couldn't give up sex, and he also uh, couldn't swallow um, the whole idea of Jesus as his vicarious sort of savior. He understood the need for God, but he didn't quite understand the need for Jesus' intercession and all that sort of thing. Um, but these are, the, these are the questions that occupied this young man when he was writing this book. And they also are smack dab in the center of his first novel, Ritual in the Dark, which I won't go on about here, but can best be described as Jack the Ripper meets the Brothers Karamazov uh, in um, dreary post-war uh, East End England. And again, even there, again, Wilson was ahead of the pack. He was doing psychogeography, well ahead of anyone here in England doing it. He was doing the kind of things that Peter Ackroyd and Sinclair were doing much later on. The idea that certain parts of town, certain parts of the city, the same kind of things would happen. And so the same kind of crimes take place in the East End in sort of 1954, uh, when duffel-coated Gerard Sorm, who is Wilson's alter ego, is hunting down or trying to understand uh, what's behind these strange murders and all that. And in that novel, Wilson uses some of the ideas that he has in The Outsider. Uh, uh, that he picked up from different people he was reading. Another person that Wilson was well ahead of the pack on was Gurdjieff. In The Outsider, he writes about Gurdjieff, and he was one of the few people to write about him that he was not part of the Gurdjieff work. He wasn't involved in any of the groups. Gurdjieff died in 1949. The first books about him started to come out that year, a bit after, but they're always written by someone who was involved in the groups. Uh, Wilson knew, Ken knew Kenneth Walker, who was someone who was in the Uspensky groups here, in uh, the 30s and later in the 40s. Uh, Kenneth Walker was also at the time uh, a known 
a sort of writer. He wrote several books. He wrote, he, he, he wrote reviews. He's another one who praised The Outsider uh, um, very much at the time. Um, but again, so Wilson was talking about these kinds of things that no one really was talking about. It was, uh, I mean, you had on, on, on the continent, you had Sartre and Camus, but the difference between, let's say, Sartre and Camus' approach to existentialism, which is basically what Wilson was doing, and Wilson's approach is that he wanted to bring in what we could call sort of mystical experience or altered states of consciousness. Uh, the term he would use in later books after The Outsider um, uh, was the peak experience, borrowing it from the American uh, psychologist who recognized that Wilson was onto something. And um, if you don't know who Maslow is, he's the father of humanist psychology. He was a very big figure at Esalen, the kind of uh, alternative think tank or hot tub, depending how you look at it, on, on the West Coast up in Big Sur. Um, so Maslow was a very big figure in the, in the late 60s and early 70s and all that. Um, and he's quoting Wilson in some of his early work and all that too. So, um, but Wilson tried to introduce these kind of so what you want to call intensity experiences, consciousness at a much higher uh, kind of level, kind of high octane consciousness. And this was something that he felt that Sartre and Camus and Heidegger had left out of their diagnosis of the human condition. He appreciated Sartre very much. Sartre is this kind of bete noir um, that Wilson writes against uh, for much of his career. He's kind of arguing against Sartre in many ways. Uh, Nietzsche said, that it's very it's it's wonderful to have good friends, but to have a good enemy is even better. Uh, and Sartre was kind of Wilson's enemy in the sense that he was always arguing against his kind of pessimistic view. Uh, for Sartre, man is a useless passion. It's meaningless that we live and that we die. We are free. We're condemned to be free. But freedom is something that we want to avoid, because freedom presents us with the emptiness of life and its meaninglessness. And so we we engage in what Sartre called bad faith. We 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 sort of make up stories. Um, <clears throat> we, we, we give ourselves identities that aren't as kind of stable as um, we pretend that they are. And then we're confronted with their kind of hollowness. And then we have the, the nausea. And Camus um, expressed something similar with the absurd. Well, Wilson was very familiar with those kind of experiences. Uh, he, um, he aborted a suicide attempt at 16 at the last second uh, when he felt that he could no longer live anymore because he kept going from these extreme states of negativity, what he called ultimate no, borrowing from Thomas Carlyle, to ultimate yes. He would go from these horrible, horrible states, these dark nights of the souls, these kind of abysses. And then he would have you know, the opposite experience, some kind of transcendent experience, some kind of sense of a kind of meaning, an overwhelming meaning. You can't be too explicit about what this meaning is. It's just the sense of meaning. It's, it's, it's the sense of, oh yes, what Wilson would later call absurd good news. And the reason it's absurd is because it's not news. It's what you knew already, but you're sort of knowing it for real for the first time. But Wilson was going back and forth as a young man from these kind of experiences. And then at the last minute, um, he decided that he wouldn't, he wouldn't go on anymore. And he was in a chemistry class, and he picked up a vial of hydrochloric acid and was about to down it. And then he had this vision, had this kind of premonition or sort of precognitive experience, or his own imagination pushed itself a few seconds ahead in time. And he knew exactly what it would feel like to take the stopper out and drink the acid and to go down his throat. And he realized at that minute what he wanted was more life, not less. So he put the vial back. And you can say that's kind of the beginning of this journey that I, I sort of try to talk about in this book. Um, from that, that, that kind of, there's different experiences like that as well. Um, there's different moments where this kind of overwhelming meaning comes over him. And He's saying they leave this out in their diagnosis of human existence, Sartre and Camus and Heidegger and the others. They leave this thing out. He wants to bring it in, and that's what his philosophy is about. And it's about how, <clears throat> I mean, one of the last books he, he put together was a book called Superconsciousness that Watkins publishes, where he distilled 50 years of, of exploration into the, the mechanisms of how to bring this kind of thing about. I'm, 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 I'm not going to give you a little DIY exercise here, and you can go you know, um, give yourself a peak experience, um, buy Wilson's books, buy my book, you can find out all about them. I'm just going to give you the background to these kinds of things. Um, but what he did was sort of pursue that vision. He pursued that kind of vision of meaning. And, but the first thing he did was write about in this book called The Outsider, these different characters who 
find themselves on the fringe, the margins of society, because they can't accept the kind of lukewarm, mediocre meanings and purposes that modern society offers. But there's nothing else on offer, so they find themselves thrown into this kind of world of extremes and where they're trying to find some kind of meaning and purpose. And then he develops what he called this new existentialism, and basically nobody knows about this. Uh, one of the things I tried to do in this book was bring this bring this to light, because it's a very important part of his philosophy. Most people know about the outsider, and then they know in the 1970s when um, he was kind of, uh, he, 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 he his sort of comeback as, as, as a writer about the occult. Uh, that's how I first heard about him. Uh, I, f I first started reading Colin Wilson in 1975 when I, I was a musician, as Atan had mentioned earlier, and I just came across this book, The Occult, um, when I was living on the Bowery in New York, and I had no interest in it, uh, uh, anything like the occult at all. Um, but um, <clears throat> I had read some of the existentialists and people like that, and when I started reading this book, Wilson was talking about them. And I got captivated in the book just because he has this wonderful narrative style. Uh, somebody once said that he could make the telephone directory very exciting, and uh, he, he could. He has this, you just, don't, you just want to know where he's going. He just has this kind of style where it's, he's explaining everything, and there's always a little bit more, and he takes you further down. Uh, and he introduced me to many, many people in that book. Not only occult figures like Aleister Crowley and Madame Blavatsky and Gurdjieff and Uspensky uh, and people like that, but also um, people like John Cooper Powys, the great um, English Welsh, or he considered himself Welsh, uh, a novelist, or David Lindsay, uh, who's the author of the great Gnostic work of the 20th century, A Voyage to Arcturus. I mean, forget Philip K. Dick. I mean, Voyage to Arcturus is the Gnostic work of the 20th century. Even somebody like Harold Bloom, uh, you know, one of the doyens of contemporary literary criticism, uh, put, put him in, in his own Western canon. Um, and so Wilson introduces you to all these different sorts of people. And it's, 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 like, it's like a liberal arts education reading uh, his books, like The Occult, or Mysteries, or Beyond the Occult, or his huge book about crime. I mean, that's something else that he writes about that I can't go into here, but uh, I mentioned it earlier, Ritual in the Dark, it's uh, Jack the Ripper, it's, it's, it's a study of a sort, a sort of serial killer. But he, it's, it's a study from an existential point of view, and it's about our sense of value, and how in someone like, say, the serial killer, their sense of value has got so small, so, so diminished that um, a sort of momentary thrill uh, is worth the price of a human life. But we are not categorically different from someone like that. Our own sense of values are not as powerful as they can be because we take life for granted. Wilson talks about something he calls the paradoxical nature of freedom. That freedom is something that we want desperately and we'll fight for it. You know, my fellow Americans across the uh, Ocean right now are very concerned about freedoms and all that. And suddenly they're waking up to the possibility of lots of things they took for granted might not be available. They know what that means now. Whereas maybe, you know, a week ago, two, three weeks ago, it was something that was abstract to them. Now it's something vivid. So well, this is something that we're all faced with. We, we have values. Things are important in our lives. But we, we become complacent about them. Wilson talks about something called the indifference threshold and how at a certain point we just grow used to everything and we just sort of take it for granted. But if we're faced with a crisis or a threat, if something forces us uh, to recognize um, the fragility of these kinds of things, then we wake up. Um, he, he, he mentioned something that both the German philosopher Martin Heidegger and uh, Gurdjieff both recognized, that uh, the surest way for man to have uh, a sense of his own being is, is, is to recognize the reality of his death. Um, this is a very grim wake-up call. Uh, <clears throat> and Wilson recognizes other versions of that. There's other kinds of notions like threat. He talks about Graham Greene, the novelist Graham Greene, when he was a teenager. He was so bored to tears with life that he, he found a revolver his brother had um, hidden somewhere. And he went off to the common, and he put one bullet in it, spun the chambers, put it to his head. And when the hammer hit an em empty chamber... Suddenly, Green, who had been so bored to tears he was willing to blow his brains out just to get any kind of kick, suddenly the whole world exploded into technicolor around him. And he talks about seeing these infinite possibilities. Now, the whole idea, the infinite possibilities were there already. They didn't just turn up. Oh, Graham Green's about to blow his brains out. Come on, guys. No. That didn't happen. Something was wrong with Green. Something's wrong with all of us. We take everything for granted. We could take it so for granted that we wind up like Graham Green or, you know, pretty close uh, to it. What happens? Well, you know, 
why is freedom something that we really want so much? We'll do anything to get, but once we get it, we don't know what to do with it. I mean, Joni Mitchell said it in the most homely way. We don't know what it, it we got till it's gone. I mean, that sounds like, yeah, that's human nature. It is human nature. Why is it human nature? It's because of something Wilson called the robot. And I'm going to try and wrap it up maybe in the next couple of minutes here about that. The robot is something that Colin said was, a, it, was, it, was it was sort of, it was a labor-saving device that we've developed the revolution. It basically takes care of tasks and operations that we don't have to so that we can get on to something else. We all know how difficult it was to learn how to tie our shoes or ride a bicycle or type or something like that. Every time you started to do it initially, every little movement, you had to spend your entire intention on doing it. You had to focus your attention on each little thing. But then one day, suddenly, you can do it. Or it's not you anymore in the same way. It's not you explicitly focusing on what you're typing. Some other part of you is doing the typing. You're thinking about what you want to type. You're thinking about the ideas, or whatever it is you want to convey, and your fingers, or whatever you want to call it, some other part of you is actually doing the typing. Or if you're a musician, it's playing the instrument, or riding the bike, or anything like that. So it's a wonderful labor-saving device. Otherwise, every time we wanted to ride the bike, we'd have to learn how to ride the bike. Every time we wanted to tie our shoes, we'd have to learn how to tie our shoes. And um, people who invented slip-on shoes would make a mint at that time. Okay? Every time we wanted to write a letter, we'd have to you know, figure out how to write. So we have this wonderful labor-saving device that can do all these things for us. Now the problem is, Wilson discovered, is that it does its job too well. It does things that we'd rather do ourselves, but we somehow can't prevent it from doing them. There's no reason why, when I listen to Mozart's Jupiter Symphony for the 101st time, it shouldn't be as beautiful as the same was the first time. It hasn't changed. It hasn't like, okay, we're going to get rid of a lot, lot of the notes now because you listen to it a lot, and we just kind of give you, da -da, da, you know, a little bit of it because you know it already. It's the same thing. But it's become familiar. What does that mean, it's become familiar? What, what does that actually mean when something becomes familiar? These are the kind of things that keep philosophers, and particularly phenomenologists, up at night. Because what, what you want to do is you want to look at something that's obvious. And philosophy, my, my favorite definition of philosophy, it's the, the, the resolute pursuit of the obvious leading to radical astonishment. Because the, the most obvious things are the things that we don't understand and we just take for granted. What does it mean when something becomes familiar? Why should it, why should that happen? So Wilson says, when you know, I'm listening to a symphony, I'm not listening anymore. The robot's listening for me. Um, if I'm talking to a friend, I'm not really talking to my friend. I'm just kind of going through you know, the robotic motions of talking while I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm going to make for dinner or something like that. It takes over things that we don't want it to do. And this is why um, Wilson quotes the line from T.S. Eliot, where is the life we have lost in living? It's gone to the robot. The robot's living it for us. Now this is the same thing that Gurdjieff meant when he said that you know, people are asleep and that we're mechanical. It's, it's exactly the same thing. Um, and in many ways, Gurdjieff's method, or we can say, w w what Wilson discovered, his insights into this, agree in many ways with what Gurdjieff meant, this kind of shock. Some, some kind of threat, some kind of inconvenience. I mean, uh, Gurdjieff was a master at in, in, in inventing inconvenience of uh, artificial crisis. He would create situations in which his students would be completely perplexed. They'd have no idea what was going on. They'd be taken out of their everyday routine, their robot, their automatic responses to things, and be faced with something. I mean, but he would do horrible things. He would be like on a train, and he would make a lot of noise, and he would eat horrible food that smelled a lot, and he would ignore everybody. And the people around him were, you know, mostly middle-class kind of, you know, students who were rather, you know, polite and courteous and all that, and they wouldn't have no idea what to do. But Gurdjieff would make, he would step on their corns. That was his kind of way of doing it. And there's a variety of different kind of alarm clocks he invented, a variety of different kinds of things to upset your kind of robot. The, fa the most famous one is what he called the stop exercise. So at his... Um, Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man. <clears throat> you'd be going about whatever things you'd be doing somewhere, and suddenly he would say, stop, 
and you'd have to freeze in exactly what a position you were in. And this would put you in, in a very uncomfortable thing, and you would sort of feel more alive and more vital and more there. But even these kinds of things, they become routine after a while. Graham Green, after you know, many times trying to blow his brains out, it's amazing, right? <laughs> It's amazing that he didn't, but um, after trying to blow his brains out so many times, it, he got bored with that too. It didn't do it anymore, all right? So he got a cannon. No, um, it didn't do it anymore. And so, I mean, same thing. So Gurdjieff's kind of stopped his, his kind of artificial crisis, his kind of uh, induced inconvenience. That didn't work, you know, for some of his students after a while. And even Gurdjieff you know, changed his tactics after a while too. But Wilson is trying to do is... I said this phenomenology, he wanted to understand what, what actually is going on, what's happening up here when we're making it familiar. It's something we're doing. We don't know we're doing it. We're not consciously aware of what we're doing. But there are mental operations that go on because the robot is something that we, over time, have not voluntarily, not explicitly, but <coughs> unconsciously have developed. It's an evolutionary device that we have developed. It's something we have learned how to do, just how we've learned how to do other things. But it's at this under unconscious kind of level. So what he wanted to do to try to uncover that. And by being able to uncover those mechanisms that uh, sort of show us how the robot operates, we'll be able to basically take back some more of the life that the robot has taken over. And it's through doing that that we'll be able to become more conscious and have more of these kind of peak experiences. Because a peak experience is nothing more than being alive and awake in a non-robotic state. That's all it is. It isn't anything mystical in the sense of some supernatural event, some grace coming down to us from some other realm. It's basically us being conscious non-robotically. So I'm going to leave it there for you folks so you can uh, think about that. And if you have any answers, let me know. Thank you. Uh, well, the question was, um, when I was researching the book, did I have any problem finding material about Colin Wilson's early life? Well, he, he wrote two, two autobiographies. Uh, the most recent one came out in 2004, and that's called Dreaming to Some Purpose. <coughs> but there was another one called Voyage to a Beginning that came out in 1969, uh, published to no acclaim. Because at that time, he was, he was, he was you know, uh, regularly being hauled over the calls by literary critics. I mean, The Outsider was the only book that got good reviews in the first part of his career, more or less. And, but, uh, no, there's, there's a lot of material in, in, in Voyage to a Beginning on his early years, and he also has um, different um, sort of autobiographical sections in some of his books. Uh, his second book, A Religion and the Rebel, uh, has a long autobiographical introduction. But uh, he told me when he was doing the second book that nobody really is interested in, you know, you until you're about a teenager. So he left out lots of stuff about his sort of family and all that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, I mean, he talks about himself here and there in lots of different places, and there's lots of interviews. And at the time, you know, people were doing a lot of sort of digging about him. I mean, he, 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 was, he was in the papers. He was in, you know, Daily Mail, the, the News of the World, all that kind of stuff all the time. He was in the Sunday supplements and, and all that sort of thing. He, was, he became famous around the same time as Elvis Presley. I mean, I think within months. You know, uh, uh, James Dean had only died a couple of years earlier. So he's actually kind of that, in that era of, of like the rising kind of pop culture uh, figure and this kind of uh, immediate kind of adulation, you know. This is one of the things that worked against him because I, 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 didn't, I didn't get to it in, the, in my rambling uh, talk, but uh, what happened was that people got fed up with the angry young men. They were in the newspapers a lot. And they'd be in brawls and things like that. And they'd be in many ways, it was like this, the, the punks in, in the 70s. Because if you read some of these interviews at the time, they're trying to get them to say something. It's kind of, oh, come on, say something outrageous. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And, um, and they really came to celebrity in what's called the silly season, uh, August, for the newspapers, where nothing's happening. Uh, Parliament's you know, out of session. There's no political news. And so the journalists need to drum up something to get something going. And so they invented this, these people, the angry young men, then they followed them around, and every time they argued, every time they had a party, every time something happened, it'd be in the papers. And so, I mean, one of the things that drove Wilson, or the thing that drove him out of London down to Cornwall, where he lived um, from 1957 until his death in 2013, and I, I, I went on a pilgrimage there, I, I start the book talking about this in 1983, um, was that 
<clears throat> he, um, his uh, wife, well, later on wife, Joy, uh, parents, they weren't too keen on him. Uh, and that they thought, you know, she had thrown her sort of chances of, you know, life away hanging out with this bohemian writer who's not going to go anywhere or anything like that. And her sister chanced upon uh, notebooks of his where he was doing research for this book, Ritual in the Dark, which is about a serial killer. And she thought it was his own journal. <laughs> all right. So there's all these entries about whatever. And so one day they, they were living over in, in uh, Chepstow Villa, over in uh, Notting Hill, at the time before Notting Hill became, you know, really fancy and fashionable to live in. It was, it was, it was a ghetto over there. Um, and um, one, one morning, um, Joy's parents have arrived, and her father has a, has a horse whip. And he says, like, the game is up, Wilson, and all that. And, and don't you know he's a homosexual with six mistresses? And, and so the, 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 the illogic of the remarks sort of was, was lost on everyone except Wilson. Um, and there was this horrible kind of fight going on. And that at the time it was going on, uh, they actually were entertaining uh, this, this notorious character named Gerald Hamilton, uh, who was a friend of Alistair Crowley's. But in any case, he ran out the door, got on the telephone, and called as many newspapers as he possibly could. And so while this thing's going on, all these journalists come down to Chepstow Villa and Notting Hill, and there's photographs and there's all this kind of stuff, and you know, finally the police arrive. But um, Wilson is being you know, followed by the paparazzi. He's, he's being followed wherever he goes. They're trying to get you know, something about him just to fill the papers. And his, his editor at the time said, you have to leave, you, know, you have to get out of London. If you want any kind of literary career anymore, you have to get out of here because you just you know you're just going to be a joke. And so, because of that, he he hightailed it down. Well, first he went to Ireland, but he eventually wound up in Cornwall and stayed there uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, so, um, he was part of this um, you know strange time where it was there was a lot of publicity about what he was doing, and then that all that all went south. Uh, the the press turned against him completely, and especially him because he was he didn't go to university. Uh, he was self-taught, and he had a perhaps unfortunate habit of uh, talking about his genius too often. Um, for what you're not supposed to do if you're English, you're supposed to be very humble. And so, oh, no, he said, yes. He wasn't going on saying, I'm a genius, but he was basically saying, well, yes, of course I have to believe in myself. I've had to believe in myself for the last 10 years. How else do you think I would have survived, you know, everything I've been through in order to become a writer? And you've just told me I was right. All of these book reviews here is saying that yes, you know, you you know, and it wasn't this kind of ego kind of thing. It's basically, you know, I knew it. You've agreed with me, and let's get on and talk about that. But what had happened is no one was interested in talking about the ideas, because as as Wilson said, and as has been confirmed to me by both Owen Barfield and Kathleen Rain, uh, two other great English writers of uh, ideas and um, sort of mystical philosophy, that the English aren't interested in ideas. They're absolutely impervious to ideas. And so Wilson was barking up the wrong tree. He was banging his head against the wrong wall. Uh, he may have had more, a better reception had he gone across the channel. But then again, he was you know, arguing with Sartre and Camus. So um, he had no place else to go but where he went down to Cornwall. And he just wrote. In between 1957, when he went down there, chased down by um, Joy Wilson's father's uh, bullwhip, um, he wrote and wrote and wrote. He wrote a series of books called The Outsider Cycle that developed what he called this new existentialism. Novels, one of which is The Mind Parasites, which is a great um, science fiction novel that uses H.P. Lovecraft's ideas and talks about this kind of psychic vampires, which uh, I think we're all familiar with. Uh, the Philosopher's Stone, writing books about crime, history of crime. Um, serial killers, he's sort of writing a lot of true crime well in advance of the um, you know, mass popularity about it. And it's not until 1971 when his book The Occult comes out, which he wrote and which Watkins has published a new edition of uh, a couple of years ago. Um, he wrote, not on a whim, but because he needed the money. I mean, the story is that his uh, American publisher approached him with the idea of writing a book about the occult, and the occult became very, very popular in the 60s. I, I've written a book called Turn Off Your Mind about the occult revival of the 1960s. And in about 1960, there was a book came out in Paris called The, uh, the Morning of the Magicians. And it kind of kick-started what became this occult revival. And at the tail end of that, <clears throat> Wilson, who had no interest, I mean, he, he read books on UFOs and ghosts and stuff like that, but he wasn't writing about the occult at all. He was writing existentialism and mysticism and consciousness and, and literature. But he was approached and asked, would you like to write a book about the occult? Because he needed the money he did. 
And it was in the writing of that book that he realized that actually there's as much evidence for the reality of the occult as there is for elementary particles. Or as I think he says, the mating habits of albino rats. <clears throat> there, there, is a, there is as much evidence there for the occult and paranormal as there is for any other thing that science credits with you know, being evidential. But the, you know, the difference is that science is only interested in kind of hard material things and the occult is about these inner experiences, these um, mental, psychical kinds of things. But in any case, this is what, this, that changed his mind doing that book. And then he becomes, in the early 70s, he, he is, it's not reinvented, but he becomes this kind of uh, very leading theorist about the paranormal and the occult. Um, there was a show called A Step in the Dark that was, I don't know if it was down here in London, but I think it was up in, you know, uh, west or out in west, whatever the BBC out there is, uh, where he was involved in different kinds of paranormal kind of experiments and, and you know, um, interviewing psychics and things like that. And then another book called Mysteries that came out in the late 70s. Um, the, the occult was a history of the occult up until, say, the 20th century, and Mysteries was about all the stuff that had been going on since that book came out. And Watkins has published that You're, as well. You've you, you quoted a line um, from Wilson's book, Religion of the Rebel, where he says, all men are failures. Uh, and you asked whether he thought he was a failure. I don't believe so. Um, and I think his sense of all men are failures is that this comes from, um, it's one of the biblical texts where, you know, I'm, I, 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 I'm, no, I'm no better than my father. And that's the whole problem with human evolution is we keep going through the same things and not getting any traction and getting anywhere with it. And the whole idea was the outsider was that he wanted to somehow do that, get a little bit more advanced on things. Uh, and I think, I don't think Colin, no, I, I, he said it himself. I mean, uh, he, he said, he basically kind of said, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say this, and I'd be a fool as well if I didn't say it. And he felt that he, he would have liked, you know, his ideas to be taken more seriously, uh, to have made a bit more of an inroad into mainstream thinking wasn't so well known, as, as you rightly point out, is that he was very optimistic. Um, he wrote a book called The Age of Defeat, and it came out in America as a Statue of Man because they wanted a more upbeat title. Uh, no, he, uh, that, that's, again, that's the difference <clears throat> between his form of existentialism or philosophy and the more familiar kind, was that he didn't believe that life was meaningless. He didn't believe that we are useless passions. He believed that actually there is a meaning, and we can. We can evolve. We can grow. We can change. We can, for him, that was gaining more and more control over our own consciousness. Relying less and less on the robot, or learning, understanding that this is, this is, this is how we're made. This is our mechanics. Gurdjieff talks about knowing the machine. And I think, Colin, A, I think he did actually add to our knowledge about that. B, I believe he felt that he did. And he pointed this out. And he basically said, you know, again, this is the kind of thing that people that are ungenerous or <clears throat> not partial to him would say, oh, this is another example of his kind of egotism. But I think he felt that there's a handful of people out there that will understand this, and they'll build on it, and they'll build on it, and they'll build on it. And something along those lines, not to say, you know, just my book, but something along those lines is happening. Um, a couple of years ago, up in Nottingham University, there's a Colin Wilson archive uh, was established by Colin Stanley, who's uh, Wilson's bibliographer and has done much to promote Wilson's work and spread it out there. Um, so I think gradually people are uh, knowing about it. And I think what will ha have to happen is that the stigma of the old angry young man days, the stigma of the kind of, oh, Wilson the boy wonder, that has to dis dissipate. I mean, again, he's more appreciated by people, I think, outside England than within it. There's, there's a core element of Wilsonians here who, you know, I mean, when he died in 2013, um, there was a lot on the web about that. And there was a lot of reaction to the kind of cliched um, obits that were written about him. In fact, I myself got into a flack with somebody who did this kind of black humor sort of thing about him um, in The Independent. And it, it, it was absolutely atrocious. And uh, at one point, um, after a kind of Facebook exchange about this, I, I, I realized the only, only proper way to deal with this was to challenge this guy to a duel. Um, <laughs> so I did. And his editor had commissioned the piece. And they backed down, and they publicly uh, apologized for it, and they retracted it and all that. 
So there, there's, there's a core of people out there that know he's important and all that. And, and they also know, you know, we, we're not slavish devotees who, that's the last thing he wanted. He, 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 he didn't want to be a guru. He didn't want to be a master. He, he, he positively, you know, pushed away anything like that. He was a writer. And what he wanted to do is people to read his books. They didn't have to agree with him, but to understand. At least understand. If you, you can't disagree with him unless you understand what he's saying in the first place. And that's what he wanted to do, is people to understand. And I think slowly there is there's some recognition in, <clears throat> not that this is that important, but in the official, professional, philosophical world, that some of the stuff he wrote about existentialism is actually pretty good and important. Some of his critiques of Sartre are, are important and good and all that. So I think gradually it'll be, and this is something I've had to do with other people I've written about. I've done biographies of Madame Blavatsky, Rudolf Steiner, Ruspensky, Swedenborg, Crowley, <coughs> Jung, is that in a certain way what you have to do is kind of a little bit dismantle what people think they know about them already. Um, the great American historian Jacques Barzin, who died a few years ago, the age of 102, he said that it's very difficult to educate the educated. People think they know about something already, it's impossible almost to get them to see, well, actually maybe it might be something else. And that's, I think, something one needs to do with someone like Wilson. And I tell you, down there in the um, National Portrait Gallery, there's a portrait of Aleister Crowley. Now, in 1922, Aleister Crowley was known as the man we'd like to hang. But not like that. They didn't want to hang him that way. They wanted to hang him this way. Because he, he too, was in the Sunday supplements. But he was the great beast having, you know, horrible sex, magic, and drug rituals over in Italy and all that kind of thing, all that. But now he's got a portrait in the National Portrait Gallery. So, excuse me, but if Aleister Crowley, the great beast, the wickedest man in the world, could be rehabilitated, I think poor boy wonder Colin Wilson from Leicester, who fundamentally was a hard-working family man. This guy worked constantly. There was not a day, his wife Joy told me, there was not a day when he didn't go down into his writing room, even Christmas and work. He worked, now, you could say he was a workaholic, he was avoiding stuff, who knows, maybe he was avoiding joy, I don't think so. But he worked every day, and what he wanted to do was just produce, 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 and he, he took care of his family a great deal. He was, he, I, 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 I knew him, you know, lots of people knew him. I, I wasn't like the chosen, you know, one or anything like that. I was around him like lots of other people. He was always very warm, generous, upbeat, encouraging, but he's also, you know, he's doing what he's doing, and you know, that, that's it. He, he doesn't suffer fools gladly and all that kind of thing. But if, as I said, if somebody like Crowley could get rehabilitated and be considered, he's in the same room as Ed, Edward Elgar. You know, he's in the same room as like the best and brightest. And he still gets a lot of flack. I mean, come on, folks. So, any case, um, I think, no, he didn't consider himself a failure. But he, all, he knows that we all fall very, very short of what we can accomplish. We all do. But I think he felt that he did, he, he, he learned something he could pass on. And that's what I'm trying to do in that book, is pass it on to the other readers as well. <laughs>